The Old Mine's Secret, Chapter 1. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, me. -y. Dick made the sigh very sad and pitiful. His father did not seem to hear it. He tilted his chair farther back, perched his feet on the porch railing, and unfolded his newspaper. It was a mild April morning, and the Osborne family had drifted out on the porch Mr. Osborne with his papers, and Mrs. Osborne with her sewing. Sweet William was playing jack straws with himself. Patsy sat on the steps with her back to the others, especially Dick, who, however, was pitying himself too much to notice her. I always get blamed for everything I do, he said mournfully, but David House for war. Vote 373 to 50. Mr. Osborne read the headline. That is the answer to the president's message four days ago. Now the Senate father. If you'll just let me off today, I'll work from school out till dark every day next week. I certainly will. Father, please Richard Randolph Osborne. You are T.O. to work your assigned part of the garden today. Today, without further pleas for postponement. Mr. Osborne's mild voice and red flabby face stiffen with determination. This was not the first week that Dick had neglected his garden task. Yes, Sir Dick answered meekly, wriggling a little. That was all he could do wriggle a little because he was made into a sort of merman. By having an old Persian shawl wrapped about him from the waist down. I think you might let me off he persisted in an undertone. Just this one more time. If mother had patched my trousers last night if she'd let me put on my Sundays. Now I could get that hateful old garden worked this morning. I've got something else to do today. Something awfully important. I'm sorry I forgot son said his mother. I certainly meant to mend them last night. I was reading, and forgot. I wish you had reminded me. She took quicker stitches, and her thread snarled, so that she had to break it and begin again. I am so sorry she repeated in the delicious voice. That made her words seem as fresh and sweet as the red roses that fell from the mouth of the fairy tale maiden. Mrs. Osborne was a dear, sunny-hearted little woman with dark hair, irregular features, and a vivid eager face. She loved to read. Indeed, she could no more resist a book than a toper could refuse a drink. But she was always so sorry and so ashamed when she neglected home duties that everyone except the person who suffered from it forgave her freely. Patsy, Dick's twin sister, came now to her mother's defense. It's your fault, Dick, she said. It's all your own fault. If you had locked the bookcase door, it would have reminded her there was something to do. And then she would have thought of the trousers. I forgot Dick confessed. That put him clearly in the wrong, and made him the crosser. He turned on his sister, growling. What business is it of yours, miss? You please let my affairs alone and attend to your own. What are you doing, Patsy? He tried to wriggle near enough to see, but Patsy made a face at him and ran into the yard. Dick was such a tease. She was not going to tell him that she had decided to be a poet and was compassing a wonderful ballad. How surprised he would be when it came out in the Atlantic or St. Nicholas, with her name in big black letters Pocahontas Virginia Osborne, as it was in the family Bible. Or would she have a pen name, like Marion Harland, if she could think of a lovely original name? But perhaps she had better finish the poem first. She perched herself in the swing and chewed her pencil and read over the four lines she had written. Johnny was a sailor. He was brave and bold. He thought he would make an adventure to find the North Pole. She could not think of anything else to say. So she read that over again, and then again. While inspiration tarried, an interruption came. It took the shape of her small brother William with two of his followers Hoppo Hop, a lame duck that he had adopted, when its hen mother pecked it and cast it off, and Scalawag, a sand-colored, bob-tailed stray dog that had adopted him. Hey Patsy, I think I'll give you a kiss announced sweet William, raising his fair, serious face to hers. I think I might give you two kisses. You are so sweet. Patsy he went on coaxingly. Wouldn't you want to lend me a pencil? Just one little minute, to make you a picture of a horse. Oh, sweet William. You're such a nuisance, said Patsy. I'm awfully busy. How can I ever finish this, if you bother me? But she gave him pencil and paper, and sat swinging back and forth, 
looking idly about the spacious yard where the budding oaks made lace-like shadows on that april morning in the center of the yard was a great heap of bricks that was the remains of osborne's rest the family mansion that had been burned in a raid during the war as those southern virginians called the war of secession from which they dated everything. Since then, two generations of Osbournes had dwelt in the roost, a cottage in one corner of the yard. It was now the home of Patsy, her father and mother, her two brothers, Dick and Sweet William, and a motherless cousin, David Spotswood. The big front gate opened on the street the one thoroughfare of the village. There were a church, a tavern, two shops, a dozen frame and brick dwellings set far back in spacious grounds, and the county courthouse in a square by itself. Behind the courthouse rambled the back way, which had once expected to become a street, but remained always the back way with only a blacksmith's shop, a basket maker's shed, and a few cabins on it. A century and a half before, three royal grant estates, Broad acres in Larkland and Mad Oaks, cornered at a stone now on Courthouse Green. These plantations had long ago been divided into small farms, but in the village still lived Wilsons and Mayos and Osbornes who counted as outsiders, all whose grandfathers were not born in the neighborhood in the kinship. While we have been looking about, Sweet William lay flat on the ground, holding his tongue between his teeth to assist his artistic efforts. Look at my horse Patsy, he crowed, holding up the paper. Hmm. I don't call that much like a horse observed Patsy. Sweet William's face clouded, and then brightened. Tell you what, he said, it'll be a cow. I'll kick out one hind leg and put a bucket here. Now, she spilt all the milk. Patsy laughed, and then one knew that she was pretty, seeing the merry crinkles around her twinkling hazel eyes, and the upward curve of her lips, that brought out dimples on her freckled pink cheeks. I love you when you laugh Patsy, exclaimed sweet William, hugging her knees. You may have my picture, and I'll sit in the swing with you. You and Scalawag and Hop -oh Hop may have the swing said Patsy. I'm going in. I'll finish my poem tomorrow. I want to find out I think Dick has a secret. She jumped out of the swing, gave sweet William's ear a love pinch, and strolled back to the porch. Dick she asked in an offhand way, what are you going to do with that candle you got this morning? Dick's gloom relaxed, and he winked tantalizingly. You wish you knew, he said. But you'll never find out. Ah, hi, eh? Don't you tell Mr. Dick? Said Patsy. I don't want you to tell. I'd rather find out for myself. And I certainly will find out, sir. You just see if I don't. Mr. Osborne still had his nose in his day old paper. News younger than that seldom came to the village. Army plans call for a million men the first year. That is a gigantic undertaking, Miranda. And it certainly is, she agreed placidly. Mayo. Black Mayo has bought some more pigeons. And Polly says he'll not tell what he paid for them. So she knows it's some absurd sum that he can't afford. Yes, her husband agreed absently. And a million men means not only men but arms, equipment, food. Bless my life. Is that clock striking it can't be? Is it 10? And I H-E-R-E ate instead of at the courthouse. He got up and stuffed the newspaper and a congressional record in his pocket. What are you going to do, dear? Asked his wife. We want to find out if the Board of Supervisors can appropriate money to send our Confederate veterans to the reunion in June. There have been so many unusual expenses. Bridges washed away in that smallpox quarantine, that funds are low. I hope they can raise the requisite amount. Of course they will. They must Mrs. Osborne said quickly and positively. Why? The yearly reunion seeing old comrades, being heroized, recalling the glorious past is the one bright spot in their gray old lives. Mr. Tavis and Captain Anderson were talking about the reunion at the post office yesterday said Dick. They are just crazy about having it in Washington. Captain has never been there, but he was telling how near he and old Jube early came to it in 64. What an experience it will be taking peaceful possession in old age of the capital they campaigned against, 
when they were soldier boys, over 50 years ago, said Mrs. Osborne. Certainly they must go. How many are there? Mayo. Nine in our district answered her husband. Last year there were 16. Three have died, and four are bedridden. Ah, <sighs> so few are left so many have passed on. Mrs. Osborne glanced through the open door at a portrait, her father in a colonel's gray uniform. Of course they must go, our nine old soldiers. Sure, said Dick. If there isn't money enough, we boys can help raise it. Mr. Tavis says he'll pay me to plant corn afternoons and Saturdays. I wasn't thinking about doing it, but our old cons mustn't miss their reunion. Good boy, that's the right spirit, exclaimed Mrs. Osborne. She adored the memory of her gallant father and of the Confederate cause to which he had devoted himself. The quiet, uneventful years had brought no new deep inspiring interests to the little southern community. Its love and loyalty clung to the past. To the children the lost cause was a tradition as heroic and romantic as the legends of Roland and Arthur, but it was a tradition linked to reality by the old gray-clad men who had fought with Lee and Jackson. As Jones and Tavis and Walthall, they were ordinary old men, rather tiresome and absurd, but call them Confederate veterans, and they were transformed to heroes whom it was an honor to serve. Dick, shirking the work that meant food for his family, would toil gladly to send them to their reunion. They must have this, perhaps their last Mrs. Osborne paused, and her husband said, we'll manage it, we'll manage it somehow. If there is a deficit, we may be able to make it up by private subscription. Perhaps I'll get a case next term of court, and can make a liberal contribution. He laughed. Mr. Osborne called Red Mayo to distinguish him from a dark-haired cousin of the same name. Called Black Mayo was a lawyer more by profession than by practice. There were not enough law crumbs in the village, he said, to support a sparrow. He strolled toward the courthouse, while Mrs. Osborne took her last hurried stitches. Then she handed the patch trousers to her son, who rolled indoors and put them on. He went into the garden and gloomily eyed the neglected square, where peas and potatoes and onions were merely green lines among crowding weeds. I certainly can't finish it this morning, he growled. There's too much to do. If you work hard, you can finish by sundown, said his cousin, David Spotswood, who was planting a row of beets on the other side of the garden. I can't work after dinner, said Dick. I've got something else to do. I just can't finish it today. You'd better, said Patsy, who had followed him into the garden. When father says Richard and shuts his mouth so, he means business. Say. Dick, what were you getting that candle for? What are you going to do? Let us go with you, Anne Lewis and me, and I'll help you here. You help. Dick spoke in his most superior masculine manner. Girls haven't any business in gardens. They ought to stay in the house and make bed quilts. They're too afraid of dirty hands and freckled faces. Patsy flared up and answered so quickly that her words stepped on one another's heels. That's mean and unfair. You know I hate gloves and bonnets and I just wear them because mother makes me. But anyway, sir, I think they're nicer than great-grandmother's shawl for trousers. She went back up the boxwood bordered walk. I'll keep my eyes on you. Mr. Richard Randolph Osborne, she said to herself. Where you go today? I'll follow. Halfway up the long walk, she came upon sweet William, sitting on the ground, holding a maple bough over his head. Won't you come to our picnic, Patsy? He said. Me and Scalawag are having a loverly picnic in the woods down by tinkling water. No, thank you, said Patsy. I want to see Anne Lewis about going somewhere after dinner. Where? Asked sweet William. I don't know till I find out, laughed Patsy. But Anne and I will do that. We certainly will. I wish Anne was staying here, sweet William said wistfully. So do I, agreed Patsy. Easter holiday is too short to divide with Ruth. Oh, I'll be so glad when it's summer and Anne comes to stay a long time. It isn't ever a long time where Anne is, said sweet William. I'm going with you to see her, Patsy, and I'll have my picnic another day. They went off and left Dick raking and weeding and hoeing very diligently, but, working his best, he had not half finished his task when the dinner bell rang. He surveyed the garden with a scowl. It'll take hours and hours to get it done, he said. And then it would be too late to go where I'm going. Maybe I can work the potato patch after supper. You can't, said David, 
who had a straightforward way of facing facts. Oh, maybe I can, said Dick. Who had a picturesque way of evading them? You might help me. You might work on it a while after dinner. Thank you. I've something else to do. I'm going to harrow my corn acre. I want to plant it next week, said David who was a blue ribbon member of the boys' corn club. At the dinner table the boys were joined by sweet William, Patsy, and Anne Lewis, a cousin who was spending her Easter holiday in the village. The two girls watched Dick like hawks, and jumped up from the table as soon as he went out of the dining room. He hurried to the little upstairs room he shared with David, that was called the tumble-up room, because the steps were so steep. Presently he came down and showed off the things he was putting in his pockets a candle, a box of matches, and a ball of stout twine. He sharpened his hatchet and fastened it to his belt. Yeah, you wish you knew what that's for he said, with a derisive face at Patsy and then at Anne. He strutted across the yard toward the front gate, but he was not to march off in undisturbed triumph. Dick, uh, Dick, called his mother. Remember you've your garden work to finish? Yes. He scowled, then he said doggedly, There's something else I've promised myself to do first. Anne and Patsy waited only to see that he turned up, not down the street. Then they ran around the back way and came out just behind him at the church. There the street turned to a road which led past the mill and on to Redville. Dick walked quickly, and the girls hurried after him. Then he walked slowly, and they loitered so as to keep just behind him. Where are you going? He turned and challenged them. Oh, we might go to the mill to see Cousin Giles, or to Larkland to look at Cousin Mayo's new pigeons, or to Happy Acres answered Patsy. Dick strode on, and the girls trotted behind him, making amicable efforts at conversation. Steve Tavis has gone fishing with John and Baldy Epps and remarked. He said we girls might go, too. But Patsy and I thought there might be something something more fun to do. No answer. Patsy made an effort. Dick she said, I hope you'll finish your garden work today. Father's tired of excuses, and he's made up his mind for punishing. But even if we do get home late, I can help you. Silence. It's a mighty nice day Patsy went on pleadingly to to do outdoor things. You say yourself I'm as good as a boy to have around. I wouldn't be in the way at all and I could hold the candle for you. By this time they were at the mill where the Larkland Road and the Happy Acres path turned from the highway. Dick kept to the main road, and the girls followed. He stopped and faced them. You said you were going to the mill, or Larkland, or Happy Acres. Trot along. I said we might go there Patsy amended, or we might go most anywhere. Do let us go with you. Please Dick. Where? Oh, wherever you are going. We'll not tell. You certainly will not, he declared, for a mighty good reason. You are not going to know anything to tell. Patsy's eyes flashed. We'll show you, she said. We are going to follow you, like your shadow. You know good and well I can run as fast as you. Now take your choice, sir. Let us go with you. Or give up and toddle home. And finish your task so as not to get punished. Hmm. He jeered. If I've got something on hand good enough to take punishment for. It's too good to spoil with girls tagging along. He walked briskly up the road. Anne and Patsy followed him for a silent mile up and downhill scarred with red gullies through woods, by brown plowed fields and green grain land. They passed several log cabins, the Spencer Place, an old mansion amid tumbled down outbuildings. Gordon Jones trimmed new house gay with gables and fresh paint. Then they came to an old farmhouse surrounded by neglected fields. Why, that door's open. Anne remarked with surprise, is somebody living at the old Tolliver place? A new man, Mr. Smith. He came here last winter, explained Patsy. Somebody new in the neighborhood, laughed Anne. Doesn't that seem queer? What sort of folks are they? Um, millimeter. Unfolksy, said Patsy. There's just Mr. Smith and his nephew Albert that goes to our school. We've never got acquainted with Albert. He's sort of standoffish, not as if he wanted to be, but as if he were afraid. Afraid of what? Asked Anne. Oh, I don't know. Nothing. I reckon he's just shy. What sort of man is Mr. Smith? Inquired Anne. Ugly. And grins. He's away from home most of the time. He's a salesman or agent of some kind. Dick Patsy returned to a more interesting subject. 
Do please tell us what you are going to do. We L. Dick began as if he were about to yield reluctantly. Then he interrupted himself eagerly. Oh, look at that squirrel. Their eyes followed his pointing finger and crying easy marks. He darted into a dense thicket of pines on the other side of the road. The girls followed quickly. But he made good use of his moment start, and they caught only glimpses of him here and there behind the trees. Run Anne, Patsy called presently, to the left, here, let's head him off. They ran around a thick clump of pines to meet him and he was not there. He did not seem to be anywhere. He had vanished as completely as if the earth had opened and swallowed him. We may as well give up and sight at last. Yes, Patsy agreed reluctantly. I reckon he's miles away by this time. Crestfallen and disappointed, they went back to the road and started slowly down the hill. Then a red-brown head rose out of a heap of pine brush so cautiously that it did not disturb the woodpecker drumming on a nearby stump. A pair of merry brown eyes watched the girls till they were at a safe distance. Then Dick, to the terror and hasty flight of the woodpecker, scrambled out of the brush heap. Cock-a-doodle-doo-oo-oo, he called deridingly. Anne and Patsy started and looked back. There he is, groaned Patsy. Yes, there he was, standing in the middle of the road, waving his hand tauntingly. Shall we chase him again? Asked Anne. Yes, said Patsy, and then. No, it's no use. He's too far away. Before we could get halfway up the hill, he'd be out of sight again. Oh, well, laughed Anne. We don't care, Patsy pet. Let's go to Happy Acres and see what flowers are in bloom. They went back to Larkland Mill that had been a mill ever since the village had been a village, crossed a footbridge over tinkling water, and followed the path to the woodland nook they called Happy Acres. Long ago a house had been there, and persistent garden bulbs and shrubs gave beauty and fragrance to the place. One spring, Anne had adopted it and christened it Happy Acres, and she and her friends had made it a little woodland park. That was a joy to all the neighborhood. It was fragrant now with a blossoming plum tree and gay, with the pink and scarlet of flowering almond and japonica. Anne and Patsy plucked a few sprays to carry home the beauty of it, and started down the path for a little visit to their cousin, Giles Spotswood, the miller. Patsy, who was in front, stopped suddenly. What's that? She whispered. It sounds like men quarreling and whispered back. Who on earth looked there? Anne crept to Patsy's side and peeped through the bushes. There were two men on the roadside. One was their cousin, Black Mayo Osborne. Who's that man? Asked Anne. Mr. Smith, the new man at the Tolliver place. Ugh, he's horrid, snarling like a spiteful cur dog, exclaimed Anne. The stranger was indeed odd and unpleasant looking. He had long loose jointed limbs and such a short body, but it seemed as if its only function was to hold his head and limbs together. The two sides of his blonde face were quite unlike. The left side was handsome with its straight brow and wide blue eye, but the right eye, half hidden by its drooping lid, slanted outward and down. The tip of the nose turned toward the bulging right nostril, and the mouth drooped at the right corner, and ended in a heavy downward line. Easy. Go easy, my German friend. Black Mayo's voice rang out clear and mocking. I am not a German, that am I not, screamed Smith. I am an American citizen. I can my papers show. I am more American than you. What are your peoples here? <sighs> what do they? This morning they did the last cent out of their treasury take. The expenses of old traders and rebels to pay. The sentence was not finished. A quick blow from the shoulder stretched him on the ground. Hey, lie there a minute cried Black Mayo, with an impish light twinkling in his dark eyes. Listen, here's a tune you've got to respect in this part of the world. He whistled Dixie with vim and vigor over and over again. Then he stepped aside and held out his hand, saying, Ah, well, you didn't know any better? Forget it. The man glared up at him, without a word. Oh, if that's the way you feel about it, Mr. Osborne laughed. 
shrugged his shoulders, and, still whistling Dixie took the road that led to his home at Larkland. Mr. Smith scrambled to his feet and looked after Black Mayo, from under down-drawn brows, with his thin, wide lips writhing like serpents. Then he went limping up the road. The girls turned white amazed faces to each other. Ah, oh, okay. Said Patsy. Let's go home. Do do you reckon he'll hurt Cousin Mayo? Of course not. He can't. How can he? Said Anne. After a pause she added. He certainly will if he can.